Today is Monday, June 26, 2017. I'm Deborah Polsky, Executive Director of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, and I'm interviewing Dorothy Wolchansky. And let's just jump right in. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your family. My mother was one of seven, and my father was one of ten. Wow. Their roots are in Fort Worth, Texas. My mother was a Lusky, which may be familiar if this goes outside of family. Mm -hmm. And my father's name is, and I, my well, maiden name, Glaves, L-A-V-E-S. Uh, I grew up in Tyler, Texas. My mother and dad had a jewelry store, pawn shop, as many Dallasites did mm -hmm. in those years. And Tyler, according to them, was the bright spot at the time where you could make a living. I was born in 1942. Uh, February 24th. So that was in the middle of all World War II and I remember my mother saying it's because you were born that your daddy didn't have to go to war. Which I have true or not, I don't know. But there was a camp. Camp Fannin was based in Tyler. Oh, okay. And in fact I had a cousin, I think it was Louis Lusky, who was based there and he would come into the store and uh, see my mother and dad during his breaks. Uh, passes or leave, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh -huh. Well, I cut my teeth in that store. I think I waited on my first customer at age 10. I sold the person a uh, rhinestone moon kind of ring, which was, uh, not ring, uh, pin. Pins were very popular yes. then, very popular then. Yes. You don't see them as much anymore. So that's where I grew up when I used to, my mother didn't drive, so I would either walk home or uh, take the bus. And sometimes, depending on the school where I was, I would walk to town from my junior high school. Um, when I was a senior, and in fact, when I was in ninth grade, they decided to split the junior high. Tyler was segregated then, of course. And, and even till I graduated high school, it was. So uh, my that year, my uh, ninth grade year, uh, was at the junior high. But my tenth grade year, while well, I wound up going to Robert E. Lee. And then John Tyler was on the north side of town, and Lee was on the south. So yeah, of course, being rebels was all natural, and that's what I did. Uh, I went to high school there, which meant, how am I going to get to high to school? The other high school, my dad could drop me off because it was near town on the way to the store. So I wound up getting in a carpool, and I had the car like one week of three, so it wasn't so bad. And I had an uncle, Bernard Le Bernard Krasner, and his wife Bessie Krasner, who was my mother's sister lived a block away from us so daddy would go down to Bernard's and Bernard would take him or Bernard would pick my father up or my father would even walk those couple or three miles to the store. <laughs> don't see that much anymore. No, no you don't. But uh, that's how it was. We lived in a duplex and then when I was 12 we moved to a house, a three bedroom, two bath house. Ranch style which was popular then as it is now mm -hmm. and for the rest of my life, my years at home I stayed there went to high school. I was in BBYO. I was very active. I was, uh, we, we had BBYO. We didn't have a, uh, an ACA and BBG. Thank you. Right. So I was vice president one time and so therefore when we had a separate meeting I led it because I was the chairperson or if you want to call it our acting president because we didn't do it. But I never was a president. And my mother did not want me to run for president. Did you go to conventions at all? I did. Because I know there was, yeah. Shreveport was one of the places they used to have district convention. Uh, I went to um, a regional convention in Fort Worth, Texas, and my father was very protective. So he drove me here, and luckily, R.D. and Beverly Moses, who we call Bubbles, uh, were there greeting the people at the desk. And my daddy was worried. He said, Abe, you don't have to worry. Go on. Believe me, these are all kids. There's hundreds of kids here. She'll be fine. Go on. Go back to Tyler. <laughs> and that was how he had his fears in LA. And I loved the convention. I loved BBYO. It was a good experience to me because seeing all these hundreds of kids were in Tyler. We had less than 30 kids. And even less than that, maybe four my age. So that wow. was Jewish. So, I mean, this was really a deal. And Jewish camps were not in my parents' Capabilities is what I'm guessing right. in those years. I went to Camp Fire Girls Camp, which was at Lake Tyler. And I did that like for two weeks. And that was 
my parents quote vacation as well because they really didn't take a vacation. Right. Their life, as in others during those years, evolved around the store. And my mother would uh, go to the store, and take a cab, and work, say, like 11 to 3 or 4. Then she'd come home and cook, therefore, she could cover so the help could all go to lunch. And that's kind of, and then I had a brother. I have a brother who named Bruce Laves, who lives here in Dallas mm -hmm. with his wife Beverly. And um, younger, and older. Younger. I, there's five years difference, so it was almost like a second family for my parents. I was doing my thing and got senior in high school and went off to school to University of Texas at Austin. And Bruce uh, had his bar mitzvah. I think during my freshman year. I think it was in the May or almost you know, right after I got home, if I remember right is when his bar mitzvah was scheduled. And my mother was always in a dither. I was the first single bat mitzvah. They had a bat mitzvah with Doris Jean Ginsburg and uh, Sarah Ann Gross and had a double b'nai mitzvah at mm -hmm. that time. And then I came along with a single. So I was not the first, but I was the first single. And it was only a Friday night service. That's what we did right. in those years. Yeah, me too. Who was the rabbi at the time? Rabbi Hyman Fishman who, by the way, as of last year, was still living. And we had in Dallas a, uh, Larry Krasner and some others of us, uh, Greta Schombrum, Herskowitz, spearheaded a committee so we could have a Tyler reunion here in Dallas. And we wrote, sent notices to all the Tyler kids, got less from everywhere. And I, I used to get so the uh, New Year's card from Rabbi Fishman. So I had his address. So I wrote him to find out where his girls were. And one of his girls and husband came to the reunion. So, I mean, you talk about reaching out, and it was amazing. So it was just, uh, in fact, we're trying to get the, the committee here to get together again, just to get together because it was such a fun project. And we're not doing it again anytime soon. <laughs> um, so there was a small Jewish community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was about 30,000 in those years, maybe. Or maybe under, I don't know when it got to that. Kay Wollins was on the square, that's where my dad's store was, where it was Life Jewelers, and there was also Schiff's Jewelers across the square. Schiff's Jewelers was owned by my father's sister, Sarah Sack, and her husband, Isidore Sack. And they were both partners in both businesses, which I learned later on. I didn't know that. They didn't keep any financial stuff to the Kindle. That was all right. right. Very private. And uh, that's that we had a phone, which I've never seen since. But uh, it had no dial on it because dial tones, dial, the dial dial was in. Uh -huh. And the phone, you picked it up and it rang. It rang directly to the shift store. And they had one that did the same thing. When you picked it up, it rang directly uh -huh. to the laser. If they needed uh, another uh, diamond ring, if they needed a certain kind of watch, okay, you go and run. I mean, we did our own. Run it over there. Right. By. So was it, was it, was your, was it a great place to grow up? Oh, Rog, yeah. I didn't like it because there were no Jewish kids when I was a junior high. There's no kids, you know. All right. of a sudden, I'm a teenager with her raging hormones, you know, looking for kids to be with, and none of them, you know, couldn't do this because you, you couldn't date a non-Jewish right. kid. Not my dad would. Nope, nope, nope. nope. That, that was it. Right. So my parents uh, did not keep kosher, but they went to services most Friday nights, and a lot of times my mother wouldn't go, and I would go with my father by myself. So I was the one who went more. My brother went, I think, afterwards, uh, later on with my dad. What, um, so your parents, what took them to Tyler from Fort Worth? There was a shop, uh, they bought a store. That's what oh, it was. Okay. And how did your family come to Fort Worth to begin with? They came through Galveston. Uh, and this was my, the story is, and this is written in the archives in San Antonio, at whatever building that is, and you may know which building I'm talking mm -hmm. about. I don't remember the Hemisphere building or something. Something. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, they came over on the boat. My grandfather came over first on the lake set. My grandfather came first with a couple of the boys, because this is one of ten. There were three girls and the rest boys. And then, as he earned enough money, he made enough money, then he could stand for my bubby laves and she came over with the rest. Now my father had typhus on the way over. They didn't know if he was gonna make it. So things, you know, disease was rampant. And where did, where were they coming from? They were coming from Russia. Some, the Ukraine is where my father was coming from. 
And I, this, this is a whole other interview is about my uh, grandfather and what he did. He was a tailor, and he, in those years, he made uniforms for the Russian army. But you couldn't touch the Russian army people, so he had to go like this to measure. This is I said, and that, and the uniforms turned out perfect. He had such a good eye. Wow. Something. And they knew about culture and the ballet or symphony. They knew about all that and they you know, participated in that in those years. And what about the other side of the family? I don't know as much about the other side. I think uh, I really don't on the Lusky side anymore about the Lay side. The Lay side, we used to get together as cousins. There were 35 of us all total and there were about 18 on the Lay side. And we would get together at a cousin's reunion every so often. And that's when we got our kids together, so the, the next generation, one uh, first cousins when we moved, we'd get to know one another. Right. And that was really good because it formed a bonding relationship. My daughter, Michelle, uh, formed a good relationship with her cousin, Holly Baum, Edelman Baum now, and, he, and they, right. uh, they're a day apart. They were born a day apart, so that made for some good things, too. That's great. Um, were your parents, I mean, obviously at that time, the store mm -hmm. and their children were the most important things. Oh, yeah. Um, were they involved in the Jewish community yes, and organizations so. and things very like that? Very much so. My mother would go to Hadassah and she'd go to the sisterhood. I don't remember her ever being a president, but I remember her being a chair. And her becoming a chair was after I left home, because she wasn't that active than I can remember when I was at home. Of course, I was interested in narcissistically me, myself, and I in growing up. Right. And didn't do that, but uh, that's, I mean, the growing up, the, the phone was in the kitchen or it was in the hall in the bedroom area. Right. And if I went, we didn't get a second line, we didn't do that for the kids. We just, uh, don't, get, when are you gonna get off the phone? I wanna make a call. Right. Okay. And I had said, can we get a long cord? So we had a long cord so I could take the phone into my bedroom and close the door because I had a brother in the house. Right. So how did you, so you went to UT mm -hmm. and what was that like? It was great. I was with all these kids. Uh, I was a journalism major and I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. So, uh, and I wanted to do this since I was about the seventh eighth grade because I had a teacher uh, Mrs. Lowe who was very encouraging he said you ought to write and for punishment if I were talking or something I have to write a thing well writing a thing was easy for me just use lots of adjectives and threw it together <laughs> and that's what I wound up doing so my father really didn't like that I would be majoring in that he said don't you want to do bookkeeping I said no I had no interest in business side I wound up to um, pacify them getting a double degree, double major. I got a degree in English, Bachelor of Arts, and I got a degree in Journalism, a BJ. So, which meant I had to go to summer school if I wanted to graduate in four years. And because I made that decision, I wound up meeting my husband, Lee, my kid's father. So, uh, a girlfriend of mine, Brenda Labovitz Levine now, she lives here, needed a fourth for bridge. I just called her to let her know I was in Fort Worth. And, do you play bridge? I said, yes. She said, okay. Uh, I was at my Aunt Rebecca's, who I was living with in Fort Worth at the time, because I was working. And, I mean, I was going to school. Uh, wrong, wrong situation. I was staying in the dorm while I was a student at TCU. And Lee wound up uh, coming to the dorm to pick me up. I was at my Aunt Rebecca's. I'd gone over there for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So they took me back. I had on shorts and my aunt had, you can't wear shorts. You need to go change clothes. So because of her, I went back to the dorm and put on a dress. Uh, a summer dress. It wasn't mm -hmm. a real fancy dress. Okay, so that's what happened there. And Lee was my partner and he had all this crazy bidding. Bringing, I'd say one thing, he would up me by another, by two levels, if you know anything about bridge, one point and the next thing. And then all of a sudden he's going in four truck. And I looked at him and he and I would look over the cards and I thought, gosh, what's going on? Well, he was a very good, strong bridge player. And he gambled at playing bridge, too, I later found out. Very early, though. And that's how we met. So then he uh, had to leave town and go get his brother, who was 
in Atlanta had gone to Army Reserve, so he had to go drive out there and pick him up. And then uh, my parents had come in, and what are you going to do the rest of the summer? I said, well, I thought I was going to stay here at TCU. They were ready to bring me home. I mean, I, it cost right. them some money, right. for living expenses. Anyhow, yeah, what are you going to do home? At least here she's got you know, some other people she can get home and get together with. Okay. So I stayed in, at there, and uh, I got a call from Lee, and he wanted to take me out. I'd seen him in the uh, union or cafeteria area. Uh -huh. I had a card that they punched when uh -huh. I did you know, things. Well, I was eating out at relatives, so I had more money on the card than I would use. So I told him, I said, if you want, you know, I'll let you use my card for breakfast and whatever. So I started doing that. So maybe he felt he had to ask me out to pay me back. Who knows? <laughs> uh, the amusing thing about it is that when he asked me out, it was always on a Friday night. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, yeah, and I had plans every time I would have a day plans. So, and he played poker. So it wound up that he had to give up his poker game in order to take me out. Okay. And then he said, where do you want to go? And I said, uh, without, practically without hesitation, I just jumped right in. I said, I'd like to go to Casa Manana to see a play. There was a dead silence on the other night. <laughs> and he said, I'll see if I can get tickets. Well, at that point, he didn't have the money to get tickets, so we talked to his mother so he could keep a lot of the money to get tickets. And all the other girls, I'm sure, wanted to go see a movie or do something else, but I was in Fort Worth. I wanted to see it. They played right. The Wizard of Oz. Beautiful, wonderful deal. Yeah. And that's how we met. And how long after, how long did you date? Before? We dated uh, three years. We broke up uh, the last year in February around my birthday. He was, I was working in Fort Worth, and he was... Uh, at UT working on a pharmacy degree by that time. Anyway, uh, uh, he came, he invited me down. We broke up because it was just different. I wasn't ready to get married. He was ready to get married. He, I mean, I thought it was a summer romance. He was ready to get married practically at the end of the summer. I wasn't ready. I had another couple of years in school and, and he had enough more. So anyway, that's what happened. And then I went down. He sent me 22 red roses for my birthday went down to Austin in May or late April for the weekend and I had a great time. So uh, that time we decided to get married and uh, officially or unofficially we I was staying with relatives Lewis and Lil Lades in Austin. They pronounce it Lavis in South Texas mm -hmm. and uh, his comment was should we call my mother or your mother first, your parents first. Uh, so we better call mine first. Nice. And Lee was on the other file and I, I said, how would you like a wedding this summer? And my mother replies, I wouldn't. And Lee said, well, you're going to have one. <laughs> she said, don't you ever do that again? So that was it. That was, so that was it. I mean, you, their big, biggest objection was uh, we're, we're both still, quote, pishers. And right. he didn't have a job and he had to go to school. And I was out and, you know, what kind of work can I do, whatever. Um, and, yeah, it all worked out. We got married and we were in Austin for two years. and as they call it, PhD, putting heavy through. I was a member of the Pharmacy Wives Club, and I worked in an office. I worked for what was then Theta Sigma Phi, which is now, I think, women, uh, just communications, women in communications it became. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, the executive director, the acting executive director, there was a falling out because they wanted to formally have an office, and the woman who was doing this was assistant to Dr. DeWitt Reddick, who was the dean of the journalism school. And I had worked part-time for him, too, on some research. So I mean, it all kind of is six degrees of separation. Anyhow, it all came together, and I worked in Austin, uh, and he was going to school. The one thing when, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, the shooter from the University of Texas. Oh, uh, um, uh, Whitman. That's the one. Lee would have normally been crossing the campus when that happened. He decided to stay home and study for an exam. Wow. So, as you say, they're by the grace of God, and that was it. I mean, it's so we had lots of sometimes very heavy stuff going on. So, how did you end up in Dallas? When he got his degree, we decided do we want to go to Fort Worth? Do we want to go to Dallas? Do we want to go to Tyler? I said, I don't want to go to Tyler. <laughs> Knew that was out. Fort Worth, well, so, so we decided to come to Dallas because it was in between. We were an hour and a half from Tyler at that time or an hour from Fort Worth. Uh, and that was where, and it did work because they would come in. If we decided that morning we wanted to go in for lunch, we could do it. Right. If we decided we wanted to go for dinner, we could do it. And we did that or, or my parents would come in. 
Um, that's what we do. So t Dallas worked out very well. Uh, Lee died when he was 44. Mm. He had lung cancer, and my kids are very aware of this. Um, it was a surprise. We did not know how sick he was. And they gave him six months to two years. He died about six months after he was diagnosed. Mm. Uh, October, November, and we even went down to MD Anderson for a second opinion. And they said they could treat him here as well, and that's what we did. So, how old were your children at the time? At the time, Howard had a bar mitzvah in February. That was the last big function or whatever he attended because uh, he died June the 4th. So, Howard was uh, 13, Michelle was about 18, and Sandy was in between. So she was about 16. She, I remember Sandy was taking driving lessons and I had to figure out how she was going to get there, whatever. We, we figured, and then when Michelle got home from school in May, uh, I told her, I don't want you worrying about getting a job for the summer. You're going to be like a second mother because I'm going to need you to take Sandy and or Howard wherever they can. Well, when she got home, Lee was in the hospital. So we had a cot in there and uh, you know, I tried to do it all night and stay up. I couldn't do it. So we did get help in there, but when she came home, the cot was there, so she literally crashed on the cot. Uh, and she, she was a great help. She really was. I mean, she just took up and just did what she needed to do. And then that's what happened. Uh, Sandy was supposed to go to Camp Ramah, which she did. But, and there was a regional convention here, BBYO. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's the time she was running for president. Uh, it was just really whatever. She couldn't go because her dad died, and so she had to be at home. So she missed that convention, uh, which I know it's probably bittersweet for her, but uh, she was like a trooper. I will definitely say all three of my children are troopers. My youngest, Howard, I do never call him the baby. I just say he's the youngest, because with all these girls, it just can be really awkward. Uh, he really came up to this. I, arranged for him to have have some counseling with somebody. I thought, I want you to see somebody. I want you to tell me if you need help, you're going to have it. Uh, but I am not going to let you not see somebody. You've got to be able to understand and work through this. He had one session. He says, Mom, I don't think I need anything. I said, okay. But if you do, you need to tell me because you, you can have it. Uh, and Lee had been mentally ill with depression and anxiety and had seen a psychiatrist for years. So we were, this family was not new to uh, depression and mental obstacles. But they did fine. Uh, and then after that, about a year later, after he died, I met someone, uh, David Eastman, who is, was just a great shot of penicillin, if you want to call it that. Um, he wasn't Jewish, but I had a great time with him. And we met because two Jewish people, I knew a husband and wife were uh, at her work and he and she came up with he had a, to have a date for a progressive serve uh, not like a covered dish supper oh, okay. for 40 plus which was a, an organization some people may know and I he they called me first would you go out with somebody who's not Jewish I said sure they said, well, explain it he's uh, and because he's active in this organization it's for helping people who aren't who are out of work uh, well, I didn't know, you know, what was going, so I, I went ahead and you know, he came, and uh, I think my son Howard greeted him at the door, you know, they were too excited, they want to see what this was going on, and we, he brought me tea, and which really impressed me because I'm a tea drinker, so he brought me tea, I'm a tea drinker. Uh, Dave was about, is about eight years older than I, uh, but we had a great time. Then he asked me out later on to go out to dinner, which we did, and the time just flew. He was a wonderful storyteller. He knew all kinds of stories, and he had been over in uh, Europe, Germany, after the occupation. Oh, now, while wow. it was still occupied, this is after war, so right. he saw a lot of stuff, and he'd tell me a few of the things sometimes, but he grew up in Indiana on a farm, and then not on a farm, his dad was a teacher. And his mother uh, got married at 14. I mean, this is just a whole other world. So she'll say these things, which I, it really makes me feel good that right. how, the, what works between those two. But it really does. And the same with the, the other uh, four adults, too. That's great. Something like speaks to your 
uh, parenting skills. Oh, that, sure, thank you. <laughs> that you've raised children whose spouses that, that is, say out loud yeah, they're yeah. awesome. Uh, that is my outstanding achievement, lifetime. Yeah, I've gotten other kinds of accolades, but is that I, I, off, I raised all three of my kids. They all married Jewish spouses, and they are leading Jewish lives. It's a lot to be proud of. Well, I am very proud of it, and uh, it, it's amazing. Now, Sandy, my middle one, uh, who's a real estate developer, she got her degree in urban planning and development from Boston University. And then she went to the University of Washington in Seattle for her uh, master's degree. In fact, she got a double master's, I believe. Anyway, she wound up uh, back in Boston because that's where she wanted to be. And mm -hmm. then she got an offer from a firm that people who worked before. Uh, the short of it is, she had worked for JPI, which is a Dallas firm, but she was in the Boston area. And then she decided to leave them, which she did for something else. In the meantime, uh, we all know what happened. The boom kind of hit us and went out. All the bu bubble went out of it. And then she decided to go on her own, which she did, and she did contract work. And she wound up working for a couple of former employees from JPI. Well, they formed their own company, as I said. And they liked her so much, they hired her full time. So, I mean, she's men are predominant in this field. They are very dominating. Yeah. You and she wears a hard hat on site, but she goes in from inception, finding the property, to doing the contract to buy it, to doing whatever permitting needs, is roads or whatever there is. She is in charge. Now so you're I'm, also in real estate. Is that I'm a correct? yeah. I'm a commercial real estate broker. I do leasing. Uh, more so than buying and selling, but also do some of the buying and selling. And I do mainly office and industrial. How did you get into that? Um, actually, it's very interesting. I was working for the Underground Shopper at the time. Uh, part time, I was an editor of the Underground Pages, which they published that one mm -hmm. time. This is back in the late 70s. And one of the people there, the secretary, was talking about her husband quitting his job at Penny's as manager with a steady paycheck and going to work as a real estate agent, residential. And she was all upset about this and so forth. She says, I don't know, you know how are we going to live, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he wound up doing it and he wound up being successful. And I heard of this and I thought, well, let me just check. Well, a good friend of mine named Carolyn Paris and her husband Bill uh, have always been supportive through both deaths and the whole thing. He is a broker, she told me. So I talked with him. He says, sure, you want to be a broker? I'll sponsor you. You, got, you just go get everything you need. If you need uh, uh, recommendations, you go get them. I said, okay. So I got the recommendations for my own, made the application. And I wanted to be a commercial broker because I've been connected with business most of my right. life. I grew up in a jewelry store. My husband had a pharmacy. Uh, I'd been a secretary or something with goals for Dallas. So I mean, I had seen certain things, and I, I just felt more comfortable in the business end. And it's proven to give me mainly it gave me the flexibility I needed. That was the big key. Because when did when did you do this? Eighty one is when I got my first job. Uh, and were your, any of your kids still at home? Or oh yeah, Howard was still at home. So you needed that flexibility to be able to. Yeah, and I didn't do it as much as I did after he left. But yeah, I needed the flexibility so I could pick him up if I needed to or whatever. Uh, the main thing is I was working for, well, Lee had to close our store. We did have a pharmacy for about six or seven years, but it just wasn't making any money. We, this is when all the Gibsons were coming into the area, and, uh -huh. and everybody went to the big box store because they could get their prescriptions at a discount, and we were a full-service pharmacy. So um, he closed the doors. Uh, and that's when he went to work for somebody else so we could make a living. We'd gone to a bankruptcy attorney. The attorney said, you let them put you in bankruptcy. You can, you can go get a job. You're, and sure enough, I mean, you know, we didn't, there was hardly a hiccup. So that's what we did. We had a bank loan we, we paid off uh, out of each paycheck and you know, kept going. And he says, you're going to have to go to work. Well, I said, okay. So I went on as a temporary and then later got hired by Royal Park, quote, we cover the asses of the masses of polyester palace. <laughs> uh, and then I was there and Michelle had her bat mitzvah coming up that October. Uh, 
and I was trying to figure out how I'm going to do all this and whatever. And a new president had come in, and I was his assistant. Then they let me go because the new guy needed somebody who had more of a fabric uh, textile background that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So that was fine because then I could work on the bat mitzvah the whole time. So and I needed at that. I mean that was good timing. You know, God closes a door and then He opens up a window, uh, and that worked out. So I was able to. At that point, I was able to you know step back. Tell me about your involvement in the Jewish community. Okay, when I first moved to Dallas, uh, we lived in Oak Cliff because Lee was working for a store, Beverly Hills Pharmacy in Oak Cliff. And I decided I what he had erratic schedule, like on one night, off the next all right. Uh, so I found out there was a the neighborhood women chapter that met at night, and there was also a National Council of Jewish Women chapter mm -hmm. club, whatever organization that met at night. So I attended both, uh, and that's how I really got started. And then the neighbors women uh, asked me to be a program chairman, or I don't even remember what it was. Starlight, the neighbors women is was a chapter. Uh, and that's what I did. And then National Council asked me, and I said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I knew I couldn't do both. I said, I've already accepted something else. And that, so because the, the die was cast, right. as they say, I just went up the ladder with that. Uh, and as an aside, one of the things that was really neat, I had a sister-in-law at the time, she's still a sister-in-law, who worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield. And she worked for the guy who put the messages on top of the building. Remember that oh, the yeah. movie message board? Well, we were doing the neighbor's women sponsoring Six Flags of Texas Day. They let us put a message on the board because I asked. And after that, that was it. One time they they wouldn't let it happen anymore. <laughs> so, but anyhow, we got on top of the building, and I was in charge of some of the publicity. And Dolly Schnitzer was there and active. And Dolly, I said, "You're going to say this, and here's you know your script, and this is it. And you're going to be in front." And I said, "You're you're the showpiece." So that was it. Was really nice to quote handle her in, in some ways. We were able to put on some public service announcements on at least one of the broadcast media. So your journalism back. Then. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it all kicked in. And that's it. So and then we did uh, audio for uh, radio. So we had coverage on both uh, TV, and yeah, we were able to talk to somebody at Channel Eight. They they had a guy there who did the public service announcements. All we had to pay for was the production, and he did that. So we had a slide for that. So I mean, these were inroads that was unheard of, because that nobody did it. Right. And. I only knew to do it because you ask. If you, yeah, you don't ask, you don't get. That's Whether it's true. money or time. That's true. And those are the two most valuable commodities out there for an organization. Mm -hmm. The volunteer time or whatever and the money to keep it running and pay the salary or salaries as the case may be. So I became president of Straw at the Neighbors Women. And then um, about 22 years ago, there was uh, nothing in the Jewish community as job support and unemployment support. Well, I knew Mark Shore, who was in that placement, and I was substituting Sunday school at the time, which I did for a long time at Sheriff, which is where I'm a member. And I told Mark, I said, I have a proposition for you. He says, is this a marriage proposal? I said, of sorts. <laughs> I said, I want to do a program, and you be the speaker, or we get speakers, and if Sheriff will agree to this, you know, we can have one night a month and I'll take care of the publicity and whatever we need to do. He agreed. And for a year or longer, he provided the program. Sometimes we get 10 people, sometimes half a dozen, sometimes more. But it, it I mean, just the two of us, it was really in, in its infancy. So at the end of that time, he said he's gonna have to back out. He just had too much that he was committed to. Huh? So I decided, uh, he said, you really should go with Jewish Family Service. So I talked to Rabbi Eliza, whose name I can't remember now. Stern. That's it. Thank you so much. She was wonderful. I can't sing enough accolades about her. And I approached her with the idea. And she says, Jewish Family Service needs to do this. I said, why don't you take... So I, I took it to the Rabbinical Council first. Then they said, with their blessing, they wanted JFS. So that's how it began. And then, I mean, I'm very proud of that. Inroad in the community, very proud. 
but that was the forerunner and the precipitating catalyst, for lack of another explosion, that's good explosion, to get unemployment addressed in the Jewish community via JFS. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there are now at least half a dozen different programs, whether you're 50, whether you're uh, recently widowed, whether you're getting back in the job market, uh, whether you're going to do a session on LinkedIn, which whoever heard of then, or whether you're going to do something on Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are all kinds of classes in our programs at no charge. And you're still actively involved no, the as a volunteer? Not as much. Uh, my volunteer is not formal. I mean, I, I send them job leads when I hear of them, or if there's something else that needs a drink. I went in and met the president, and I said, I want a chance to meet you and let him know. So I let him know that I had been active. I haven't been active recently, though. But, uh, I mean, that was a commitment. One, second Tuesday of every month, uh, and doing that. Now, I even wound up getting, thanks to them, the International Association of Vocational Services Award uh, because Camille Kramer, I don't know if you ever know her, okay, she's, she's, I don't know what happened to her, but I, she's left, she's gone, and I, if you know, I want to talk to you about that afterwards. All right, but Camille is, was the, um, the staff person, and I was the volunteer. But what really happened is they had signed Ellen Loomstein, I don't know mm -hmm. if you know Ellen, mm -hmm. okay, Ellen and I are very good friends, because of JFS in this program. So she was hired as the part-time person to do this with me. We did 11 o'clock meetings on the phone at night, figuring out the publicity, what we're going to say here, what to fax, how we're to do this. We spent a lot of time making this program happen. I mean, we literally birthed this baby into what it is today. You have a lot to be proud of. It's well, a wonderful you. program. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's tops. And when I meet people uh, and they're unemployed or they're in transition, I say, you need to go to JFS. And right. now sometimes, oh, well, I know, I've been there. I think they've got wonderful programs. Aha! Uh -huh. Right. I mean, it's, I didn't go sing my praises. This is something I wanted done for the community. And actually, because my husband was a member of uh, 40 plus, and I saw what it was doing, I thought that's kind of what I thought, well, if he could do it. And a good friend of mine, Carol, Carol Perry, said, well, why don't you get it in the community? I said, how? She says, you know, people talk to them. That's what did. I did. I did. You know, you just had to say, do it, and I did it. All right, so we're about ready to wrap up. Okay. I'll ask you one last question. Um, you have grandchildren. Yes. And um, I'm sure you want to leave some kind of legacy to have them know who you were and who you'd like them to be. And so the last question is, um, what would you like to say to your next generations and the generations to come? I'm going to say it all comes down to be the best you can in whatever you do and do the best you can work-wise or career-wise or uh, volunteer-wise. I'm hoping that the values that I left to your parents will also become the values that they leave you and that you can take on to the next generation. The values of having compassion and caring for other human beings are as Dallas Hebrew Free Lung, which is where I've really been active lately, uh, in the Lung Committee for several years. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's another story by itself. And that's one of my babies too, beside JFS. Uh, put a hand out, not a hand up. And that's, that's where it all is, because only by the grace of God and what you do and what you learn are you not there on the street or out there not finishing high school and working as a laborer in a warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, education is definitely prime. A Jewish education, meaning whether it's Sunday school or full time, uh, just knowing what's going on, and believe me, if you live in a small town, it's only a short distance for you to make arrangements for transportation to find a, a Jewish synagogue. You may not be there every week. If there's a bar bat mitzvah, a rabbi definitely can make arrangements. In today's technology, there's no reason you can't do a face-to-face -face for a lesson. So the world is exciting, 
and hopefully will still be exciting and still peaceful by the time I die and depart from this wonderful world. And there's a lie out there. There is. Uh, and that's why I was leeching. It's funny you say this because I went to a grief support group. Uh, the woman's name is Mary Frank. That's not her real name, but she's not living anymore. One of the things she had us do was write our, quote, values will. What you read in the newspaper doesn't tell you anything about the person. Right. What is your values will? What do you want to leave? And this is the same question you're asking me in a different mm -hmm. way. And I wrote one. And if I'd known that I needed that, I would have brought it. But basically, um, again, do the best you can in whatever you do. And if you think something's right, follow your dream. If you think it's not right, do what you can about it. And we are not in control of so many things. Be aware that there's some things you can control and some things you can't and better left not to. And that's what I would leave to them. Okay. Does that help? That's great. Thank you very much. We are thrilled to add your voice to our collection of, uh, as a, of our oral history project. And, um, and we'll stop here.